Well, what's up, family? Uh, it's good to see you. Today is Tuesday, October 26th, and uh, I'm, I'm, I want to just begin by apologizing uh, that we're not together live tonight. I thank you for your flexibility. I, I, I double booked myself and didn't realize it until about 3.30 uh, this afternoon, and I didn't want you guys to be uh, left out, and so I, I rushed home and uh, made sure I was able to do my best to at least give us some framework for our discussion. Discussion uh, that you've been preparing for tonight as you've read uh, Hebrews chapter number three as the writer has continued uh, in this uh, chapter to delineate or separate, if you will, himself from uh, or separate Jesus rather uh, from anything else that the people uh, who are reading have esteemed that these uh, these Hebrews these Jews had esteemed so uh, he wants to be very clear that Jesus stands apart separate uh, from uh, and above separate and above anything that they uh, they have esteemed and so uh, I'm grateful for this opportunity again thank you so much for your flexibility and and, and your willingness to kind of go with the flow uh, tonight, I pray that this doesn't diminish your fervor uh, as we uh, spend these few minutes together now. Uh, obviously, we won't have the interaction tonight, but this will be uh, a good opportunity just to kind of answer some questions. And if you had some questions that you didn't get an opportunity, uh, that you didn't get an opportunity to ask me because we weren't together, uh, please take a note of it and we will carve out uh, some additional time uh, to make sure that we are able to address uh, those questions uh, in the coming days. Let me pray for us. Uh, tonight, and then I'm going to dive into a discussion around chapter three uh, with you, and prayerfully it will add some fodder for your uh, your devotional time as you spend time reading and understanding uh, the words of this great epistle. Let's bow our heads uh, and our hearts. Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for these wonderful, uh, incredible people who are yours, Lord God. Thank you for their heart and their passion for you and their pursuit of you, even in their world. Word, Lord, I pray uh, tonight, even for those who have pressed their way uh, only to get together to realize that I wasn't going to be in the room uh, live. God, thank you for them. Thank you for their hearts for you, Lord God. I pray um, that you would, even through this video, that you would allow your word to come alive to us, uh, Lord God, that the light bulb would come off on for us, um, that we would glean much of your word, uh, ultimately, Lord God, that we can live out your glorious gospel and make much of you in this uh, dark world that we live in. We thank Thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. I pray, Lord God, that you would lead us and guide us into all truth as only you can. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. 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 So we're going to jump in tonight to our to our lesson. We're going to jump into our lesson uh, tonight. And, and I'm grateful uh, because we're going to read together uh, chapter three together. Grab your Bibles. Let's read chapter number three together. This is what it says. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of this heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him as Moses was also faithful in all of his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory, uh, more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. Verse number four, for every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all of his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterwards. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are if we hold fast the confession and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Verse number seven. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of the trial of the wilderness, where where your fathers were tested, where your fathers tested me, excuse me, tried me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said they will always go astray in their hearts and they have not known my ways. Verse number 11. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. 
here begins this conversation about rest that will actually go even into chapter number four. Verse number 12, beware, brethren, lest there be any of you, uh, any, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our conf confidence steadfast to the end. Verse 15, while it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed. Was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of their unbelief. Wow. Wow. Interesting as we read this passage and as we see the writer contrast for us, uh, Moses and Christ Jesus Con contrast for us the faithfulness of Moses to the extent that he could be faithful. He should receive honor for his faithfulness. But he says, uh, but, 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 but Jesus even the more, uh, because he is the creator and sustainer of it all. And so he, he highlights this, this, this contrast, Moses, who is highly revered, yet he pales in comparison to Jesus, the Christ and the people who who Moses was leading, many of them, because of their hardness of heart, because of their disobedience and their unbelief, ultimately were not able to enter into the rest that God had prepared for his people. And so you hear this refrain uh, over and over in this passage today. If you hear his voice, don't harden your heart like the fathers did in the provocation or in the rebellion. Don't, don't, don't do what they did, because if you do what they did, you're going to get what they got and you won't be able to enter into the rest that God has for those who are not hard hearted, those who will not harden their heart, those who have their heart tender and their willingness to respond in faith to what it is that God says. And so I want you to get a couple of takeaways uh, from chapter number three. Um, and, and so I, I want to just kind of highlight a couple of things. If we were in class, I would have waited and we would have been able to have some dialogue around your thoughts uh, and what stood out to you as you read that. If anything stood out to you and you'd like to, you know, to revisit it, please don't hesitate to send me an email or keep a note of it so that we can have that dialogue uh, when we're back together. But the writer, the writer gives great attention to this reality that Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is superior to Moses. This, this is a vital point uh, of this argument. And, and there was no human being that was more revered in Judaism than Moses, this, this one who received the law of God, who, 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 who actually experienced the presence of the Lord and brought the people, um, the, the, the law of God. And so, so, so the, the, the writer wants to be very clear that, that this one who is a hero of our faith, who we have revered, who, who we honor him for his faithfulness yet, he pales in comparison to the Lord Jesus. And so it begins, if you will, to kind of point into this, this next warning um, because he, he wants to be very clear um, that, that there were some, some deep consequences for those who were disobedient. They were not able to experience the fullness that God had for them, um, but he, he wants to be clear, don't be like them. When you hear the voice of the Lord, don't harden your hearts as they did, uh, because you'll get what they got. Speaking of this time of Moses, the scripture reminds God's people of the Exodus generation. 
Those were those who could not enter into the land of promise because of their disobedience. I want you to think about this. Uh, when, when, when God delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt, he wasn't just delivering them out of somewhere. He was delivering them to something, to another place. God had a prepared place uh, and waiting for them, a place that would be a blessing flowing with milk and honey, a place that would, would meet all of their need. God had set it up for them. God had created a, a, a wonderful, wonderful promised land for them. But their failure to experience the rest was connected to their hardened, sinful hearts that just simply would not respond to the word of the Lord through Moses. You remember the narrative when you consider what happened. They come across, uh, first of all, they get to the Red Sea. God does the miraculous, allows them to go across this body of water on dry ground. Some two million plus people cross it. And then in the same place that they had just crossed, God used to swallow up the enemy Pharaoh and his army, his chariots, try to follow them through the Red Sea. And as soon as they get to the middle of the Red Sea, God pulls the partitions and the Red sea drowns them and the scriptures recorded that the enemy that you see today you'll see no more forever and so god does miraculous things and they're moving and 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 and, and they began to long for the groceries that they had back in Egypt. They began to talk about why did you bring us out here uh, just for us to die? And God in his in His wonderful mercy, it's amazing how God always pairs judgment with mercy that even though, uh, even though they deserve judgment, God said I'm going to slip in some mercy. Even though God could have cut them off right then but instead God says alright, you hungry I'm going to give you uh, uh, some pancakes from heaven. I'm going to let manna rain down. You get tired of manna, I'm going to let quail commit suicide in the camp. You just go outside and grab a bird that you can cook and, and, and eat. I mean, you, 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 now you're thirsty and you're frustrated. God said, I can make a rock give you water. I mean, God was faithful to the people for 40 years, but their hard hearts made it such that God said, you can't enter my rest. Their unwillingness to listen to the word of the Lord spoken through Moses meant they were, watch this, disqualified from their destiny. Let it not be said of us that our disobedience disqualifies us from where God would have us. And I want you to know, you can still abort the uh, promise of God by your own disobedience. You can do that. And their, their failure and the judgment that followed uh, is a warning addressed to all of us who hear God's words in, in our heart today that we do do not do what they did. Those who will not believe God's word demonstrated uh, with a demonstrated belief through obedience will never experience the rest, the promise that God has even today. These are high takeaways from chapter three. I mean, chapter three is really a challenge that we do not repeat the history of our fathers, that we do not, you know, and this, this is written to, um, to, to, to Jewish uh, folks who are Jewish by nature or, or Jewish sympathizers, those who, who have been converted and, and have been following. And so he's saying to them, you, you can do all of this stuff, but if you if you have a hard heart, you will you will abort much like our fathers did, who whose corpses fell in the wilderness, who never experienced the promise that God had prepared for them because of their disobedience. Don't be like them. Today, when you hear my voice, don't harden your hearts like the fathers did in the provocation, in the rebellion, and they could not enter into the rest of the Lord. And so, so, so when we think about this, this picture um, that the writer wants us to see, um, this picture of Moses and Jesus, Moses is praised for his faithfulness as, as, a, as a servant, thereupon is the word, as a servant who is high above a, a mere slave in status. He's, 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 he's a servant, but he's He's a servant with some dignity. He's a servant with some rank. He's he's a servant, but he's not like just the you know the the lowest of the lows. And, and, and he was faithful. And he's saying no, but Christ was faithful. But Christ is superior to Moses in a whole bunch of ways. And he kind of shows some of them. Number one, he's superior to to Moses in relation to God's household. See, because Moses was never more than a member of the family. 
but Christ is the architect who built the family. Moses, Moses benefited, but, but Christ was the benefactor. Mo, Mo, Moses served, but, but, but Moses was serving uh, the Lord. And so he said he's, he's superior in relation to God's household. He's also superior in relation to his role. Moses is an important servant, but Jesus is the son and the heir. Uh, the, 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 the servant isn't the son. I think on the syllabus, I wrote the servant versus the son, right? So, so, so both can be faithful, um, but a servant will never rise to the place of a son. Uh, and so that's what the, the writer's clear. Uh, Jesus is superior because of his role. He's superior in relation to ministry because Moses would speak about what would happen. Jesus was the future that Moses foresaw. So, so in other words, Moses was talking about something that was to come, and Jesus is the fulfillment of that which is to come. And so in every single way, Jesus is far superior to Moses. And Moses, to this point, is the towering figure in Judaism. And so that's what the writer wants us to be clear about, that, that even, even the one that we esteem greatly is 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 far inferior to the Lord Jesus, and so a, a couple other things, and um, and I'm gonna let you go, man. I I figured if we could have 20 minute video, I don't and I don't want to keep you, you know, watching the video too long. I pray that it just adds some context to your conversation uh, as you study this passage out. Um, but 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 a couple of additional thoughts. Um, they use the word the voice in verse number seven, uh, in this passage, voice is. Um, any direction from the Lord delivered through scripture or through the spirit's working in another believer, right? And so because the Holy Spirit, uh, because Holy Spirit is the one speaking, true believers will hear and recognize that voice. Jesus makes this argument in the gospel of John when you see the conversation around um, uh, Jesus saying, I'm the door and I am the good shepherd in John chapter 10. And he, he talks about my sheep hear my voice and another they won't follow. See, what, what the writer wants us to understand is that the Lord Lord is still speaking, and if and, and those who are true believers will not harden our hearts, but instead will respond in faith, believing what He says. And so that's 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 the that's the initial um, uh, 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 or or the idea when you read the word voice in the passage, as well as the word today. Th this word today in verse number seven. It reminds us that God's voice has a today expression. As, as, as you know, God was speaking to the children of Israel uh, in the Exodus account. Uh, and so, so the writer here says, well, today, when you hear my voice, don't harden your heart as the fathers did in the provocation. We can know uh, and at God's will, and we can hear him speak to us today through his word and through others. Can I tell you something? Whenever we rally around the word, whether we're, we're reading the word for ourselves, whether we're in these classes, whether we're, we're in worship service, God is speaking to us through his word. He's speaking to us in the today expression of his word. And, and many of us do just like the children of Israel as God is speaking, we harden our hearts. See, see, the key to our personal relationship to God is being sensitive to the spirit of God so that we can hear his today voice, that we can hear how he's speaking to us uh, today. And then we don't respond like our forefathers and, and, and like the, the, the Israelites, and we don't harden our heart and act like we didn't hear what we heard. Because when we do that, we, we watch this, we cut our own, as the old saying goes, we cut our nose off to spite our face. We, we, we do our own self a disservice. We, we cut ourselves off from what God has from us. And, that's, and so he begins to talk about this idea of rest. And this word in the passage is used in a variety uh, uh, of ways. It, it, the, the model of rest is, is certainly a picture of the promised land, this, this peace and prosperity that would follow this rest when the people of God got to this place that God had promised for them. They may have to go through some difficulty, but there is a place of, of of peace and prosperity and abundance. There's a place where there is milk that, that that's flowing. There's a place where the, the, the fruit is, is available. Like there is this place. So it's speaking certainly of the promised land and, and what would happen when they got there. But rest is also an inner experience of peace. 
Uh, there's, there's a sense of rest that can happen right where you are. There's a sense of peace that, that can be available to those uh, who trust in the Lord. There is access to a, 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 an experience of God's rest that comes from the assurance that we are just where God wants us to be, doing exactly what he wants us to do. Man, and we'll, we'll read this when we read in chapter 4. It says that there, there remains a rest. Uh, for, 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 for those of us uh, who, who, are, who are loving God, those of us who are obedient to God, there remains, there remains some more in front of us, another piece of God's promise. And so our task as Christians is to be sensitive to God's voice, respond to it with obedience, and so we can experience God's rest. And we can experience God's rest every day. And we, we, ought, we ought to long to experience God's rest and, and accomplish it through obedience to him. Because, and we see in verse number 12, failure to trust God, failure to believe God, failure to do what God is telling us to do is the root cause of being cut off. It was the root cause of ancient Israel's rebellion. They did not believe, and so they disobeyed. But faith and obedience everywhere in Scripture are linked together. For true faith is what releases us from our fears. And it, it results in us obeying God gladly. Man, I, I mean, this, this, this passage, um, a simple passage, but a profound passage, it begins this, this warning, this, this reminder, if you will, to us uh, that we ought to be careful that we don't find ourselves disobedient and therefore disqualified from that which God would have for us. And I pray that as you consider these things, as you think about um, how it is that you may have, I may have hardened my heart uh, in, toward the Lord uh, regarding the things of the Lord and the will of the Lord and, and, and the word of the Lord in my life and, and, and repent that we not forfeit our rest forfeit the peace and the assurance of being in the will of God, knowing what God wants and doing what he says. There is no safer place to be than in the will of the Lord. And so that's what he's telling the people. Don't, don't defect. Don't, don't, don't do what, uh, don't do what your fathers and grandfathers did. Key verse today. If you hear my voice, don't harden your hearts as the fathers did in the provocation and they were unable to enter in my rest. But when you hear it, you respond in faith. And I believe when we do that, the Lord is pleased. As Hebrews chapter three, uh, next week we will read and begin to have a conversation around the remaining portion of Hebrews chapter four, as he continues this thought in chapter four, but he, he expands the thought and begins to talk to us about, uh, about the Lord being the great high priest, because not only is he superior to Moses, he's superior to the priesthood of Aaron. He's superior to the priesthood of Aaron. The priesthood of Christ reigns supreme. And so we'll talk about what the priesthood is and, and why it is that the Lord is our great high priest. Amen. Amen. And amen. Listen, I love you. Thank you for grace tonight. I pray that you glean something from these few moments uh, of watching this video. And I pray that you've taken your notes and you had your questions written. So if there's any way uh, that we can continue the conversation uh, next week, I will begin uh, by addressing some of those things. Let me pray for us tonight. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the privilege that you give us to study your word. I thank you for these wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, who have uh, been in pursuit of your heart. I pray, Lord, that you would show us areas in our life where perhaps uh, we have hardened our heart and we've done just what the fathers did uh, in the day of the rebellion, Lord. And I pray that you would allow us to repent. Uh, you'd cause us to repent and allow us to be sensitive to your word that we do not abort the rest that you have for us. That's our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, God bless you. I love you guys. We'll see you real soon. Peace.